Welcome to Master the World. My name is Li Ming Stro. I'm a co-founder and CEO of Master the World. Without further ado, I'm going to introduce our panelists and then we're going to flip to the next slide. Uh, first of all, from my screen, the very top, Tim Gazer in New Mexico. Hey, everybody. Hope you're doing well. Wonderful. Thanks, Tim, for being here. And then we have Madeline Trafon, Master Sommelier from Detroit, Michigan where it is bright and sunny and damn cold. Very happy to be with you. I've missed doing this. So very, very happy to know that you're there. Wonderful. And then of course, Evan Goldstein here hey, uh, in San Francisco. Yeah, hey everybody and, and, and welcome. Um, it's a treat to, uh, to be here today. It's a treat to always be with the, uh, the folk, the community of Master of the World. In future kits, you will see this sheet in every single kit. It'll have a QR code that allows you to click on to get the clues for this particular kit that you're getting. Now, of course, I'm not gonna show you today's clues because we're about to go through it, but when you click on it or you can use this um, URL right here, mtwwines.com, what's in my kit, it's a new feature. For those of us like me, who go, the world of wines is just way too big for me to guess what this is. This is what we can do for you. You can reveal the wines in alphabetical order. So you have six wines in front of you rather than a whole world of wines. And from a baby step standpoint, you can take a look and say, okay, the first one is white, so it's not a Chinon. There you go. And try to guess and mix and match which one is which. If you are just tasting for fun and you want to see the tasting notes right away, you can actually click on the next reveal button and you'll get the correct order, the correct wine, and that little icon where the printer icon is, it'll actually give you the correct tasting note for this as well. It'll have the rationale for how to taste this wine. It'll have all of the details from sight to aromas to structure so that you can see all of that. This also works for any kits that you have from us in the past. You can always go back. All you have to do is change that SKU number to the correct 125A, or if you're tasting ahead, 126A if you've received that kit. So enough from me. I'd love to hear your guys' feedback. If this feature is a total dud, let us know. Um, if this feature works for you, let us know. And without further ado, we're going to go to wine number one, which I believe, Madeline, is you. That's me. Aromatically to me, this wine is highly aromatic. It, what I mean by that is I don't have to work at all. It, it just jumps out of the glass at me or, you know, walks towards me. And what I get immediately is this combination of beautiful citrus, uh, lime, both um, fresh lime and uh, a little bit of um, lime peel, and uh, maybe an illusion of sweetness like key lime. And then Right on the back of that, I get this gorgeous floral expression, both, you know, dominantly, I would say fresh flowers, maybe a few dried flowers, but definitely um, citrus blossoms for sure. And maybe some um, other flowers as well, like um, lavender. I'm going to go ahead and take it on my palate so I can talk about the nose and the palate together because they are, just to remind us all, one and the same thing. And I'm digressing slightly to structure, but the acidity is bracing, even if I don't quantify it at that moment. So here's a party trick. If the acidity throws your head back in the wine because it's the first wine you've had that day, I often turn around and take it immediately back on my palate. So the, the body's going, got it, we're doing acid, hold the boat. And then I can be more, um, <clears throat> I can assess the acidity more easily that way. Um, on the palate, the, um, the lime expression and other citrus as well, certainly lemon, maybe even a teeny little bit of grapefruit is there, but lime drives the wine, um, <clears throat> both uh, fresh lime juice, lime peel, and maybe a little bit of, um, uh, of a sweet lime as well. I don't want to say candied. Um, what I'm getting fruit-wise on the palate is green apple or unripe pear. So there's certainly a little bit of tree fruit. Uh, stone fruit, not a big expression. Back palate, maybe a little bit of, um, of unripe peach or nectarine, uh, but definitely secondary notes. 
The florals on the palette too. I love that expression when you're chewing on flowers and a wine that has that. Um, and then right on the heels of that, you have an herbal expression of related fragrances of lemongrass, sorrel, and verbena. Um, so, you know, the citrus is strong. Uh, back notes of um, honey, actually, a little bit of honey, uh, though, you know, again, much like the stone fruit, uh, it comes a little bit later and it comes uh, within this really protracted, expansive finish, actually. This wine is all about promise to me of what's to come because it seems young at the time, uh, at this moment. There is a richness mid palette. Um, and also going back to the herbs for a moment, especially aromatically as it warms up in the glass, there's a cool tone that has to do with mint perhaps, you know, um, high toned um, green herb. And there is another aspect, especially on the palate, there is a minerality to the swine. It lurks, but it's very evident once you get the other stuff out of the way. It has to do with like a slaty, you know, sommeliers. Consumers are always telling me, what do you mean when you say minerality? <laughs> you know, the impression of rocks um, or wet rocks, especially, which, you know, gardeners know, um, fly fishermen know. But what it speaks to is either, in my opinion, pulling back for a second, it can be an expression of specific terroir, but it can also be an expression of uh, the grape variety. So to look at the wine um, uh, in terms of quantifying the structural elements, I would call the acidity medium plus to high. Actually, on this call, I'm going to say high. The uh, alcohol is moderate. It doesn't pull my attention and that's further um, reinforced by the way the wine moved in the glass. Um, oak influence, none. Uh, not, you know, large oak, neutral, nothing. Uh, you know, this wine has been made and aged um, in a completely inert vessel. Um, long finish. It has complexity at this moment but I think it's going to develop more. Um, it, I get very excited when I taste a white wine that, that uh, has that promise, because quite often um, we are supposed, you know, we, we save the impression of, um, of uh, you know, what's to come or the age-worthy character of the wine or the promise of the wine when you think about red wine, but there are absolutely two or three um, white noble grapes that I can think of without even trying that at their best will often make white wine that can age as well as any red. Um, I'm going to encourage folks out mm -hmm. there to certainly start giving a, a guess. If you already know what it is, what did you think it was before you found out what it is? Mm -hmm. um, because we want to hear from you as to how difficult mm -hmm. or easy it was to deduce from what you're tasting or what you're hearing. I want to amend my, or actually add to my descriptions. There's another element that is, hello, rather important, particularly when it comes to deductive reasoning, that simply didn't pull my attention because it is, to, is, it is actually so well integrated. There is um, TDN on this wine, that expression of, um, you know, whether you want to call it petrol, diesel, just was at the gas station, but it is melted both aromatically and on the palate into the wine so that, again, it doesn't command at least my attention. And I really get annoyed when it dominates um, because then it's like, you know, a little herd of elephants in the room and you can't get past it. So um, what are we left with? A highly aromatic, citrus driven white wine that's medium bodied with a very long finish, age worthy with uh, high acidity and uh, pronounced uh, minerality. Great, we've got guesses from Sauvignon Blanc to Riesling <laughs> to Un Oak Charnay, and even we have um, Old World. So I, before we reveal, uh, Madeline, what is gonna help you decide Old World or New World in this mm. case, do you think? You know, this is where it gets a little bit tricky because especially if a grape variety has sort of, you know, systemic <laughs> minerality in it, you know, generally when we smell uh, a strong, stony, slaty component, we go old world, got to be Europe, right? Um, but that's not always the case. So I'm going to give that gentle hint there. Um, I think also the dominant quality of the fruit 
Um, it's very upfront, even when it airs in the glass, you know, um, the lime followed by green apple is right up front. And, um, you know, I'm not going to say a lack of complexity in its youth, because I think either an old world or a new world white wine would do that. Great. All right. Let's go and take a look at what we're looking at. Oh, I love this part. Yay, we are going around the world too. I'm easily pleased, Tim. You know, we are in Australia. We are in South Australia. We are east of the Barossa Valley and it's Barossa, not Barossa. I had the Australians correct me more than once. Um, it is not, however, Shiraz. <laughs> we are in the Eden Valley, uh, which is a high altitude uh, growing region. And um, it is high enough so that we are at, I believe in this case, around 500 meters above sea level, which, you know, times three is significant in terms of feet. Um, and there we are. And uh, we are not um, as of yet showing the grape variety, but it's got to be, hello, you know, and you're far enough inland so the maritime influence from the Gulf is not what um, you know drives the geography impact on this wine. Um, so can we go ahead to the reveal? Absolutely. Here we are, and somebody called it actually. Uh, somebody Angela called did. it. They said Clare Valley or Eden Valley Riesling, and I want to not only compliment you on having your um, ha you know of, of uh, calling the grape variety, but I love the fact that you said Clare or Eden because sometimes people will agonize so much over, gee, how do I tell Claire from Eden? And I'm sitting there going, if you've got Riesling and you're wondering about old world <laughs> versus new world, this is a good problem to have, right? However, we had other people name highly aromatic uh, grape varieties, Sauvignon Blanc, um, you know, which certainly has a very strong citrus element, and Albarino that I tend to call semi-aromatic, though the floral components definitely, you know, up front, uh, in Albarino, but I don't think it's as strong as it is in Riesling. And also the mouthfeel is very different. And I think the acidity expression is different as well as the alcohol. So we are um, a terrific producer, Pusey Vale, that um, enjoys a rock star winemaker, uh, Louisa Rose, who you may know, um, Tim and I were talking about her a couple hours ago. I, one of the winemakers I've been privileged to meet. And um, she also is the lead winemaker and has been wait for this, her first job um, when she got out of um, uh, university winemaking, you know, where she actually also studied uh, science and um, I believe physics, her first job and she made a bunch of cold calls to wineries in the Barasa was at Pusyville, not Pusyville, sorry, Yolumba. And since then she's been the um, first assistant and now the lead winemaker from uh, Yolumba. And I think she's as, as important as anything you can say about the winery because she really is tremendous. We're gonna show a picture of her too, I yep. think. This is young too. It says 2019, but boy, does that speak to the wine's promise? Cause I would have called it 20, you know? Uh, and it really shows you how this wine has got a long future ahead of it. This is a single um, plot. And that's why it's called, is it, it's called 18, uh, it's called 1961 block, yeah. but these, um, these vines are um, based, uh, propagated from the original 1847 vines. This was the first winery, the first folks to plant uh, anything in the Eden Valley. Um, how cool is that? And um, you'll notice how undulating um, the vineyard, um, uh, plantings are, and I'm curious if one of my colleagues in a moment will speak to that, organically certified uh, in the, like, I think 2013. And you know where the cuttings originally came from? I read it three times. I didn't believe it. They came from an English, um, English cuttings from the Royal Horticultural Society's garden in Chiswick. Uh, go figure, you know? <laughs> So, you know, Riesling didn't care. It, it made a, a cool little journey to get here. But Eden Valley and Clare Valley Riesling are uh, as interesting uh, qualitatively as good at their very best as anything from. Let's do the drum roll about where Riesling does a good job. Austria, Germany, Alsace, you know, I will add New York State, Michigan. Right. Uh, you know, it is a grape variety that is a very successful traveler. It's a little bit fussy 
about, um, you know, it, it's not fond of warm climate, um, though it can do, you know, an okay job there too. And it loves it here. Uh, I don't know as I can tell the difference between Claire and, um, and Eden Valley, though uh, if conventional wisdom and memory serves, I think the um, Claire, the Eden Valley Rieslings are more lime dominated and exactly. uh, Claire Valley is more floral, but certainly both components are uh, here. I think this is an absolutely gorgeous wine and I can still feel it. My mouth is salivating. Here's uh, the, the wonderful Louisa Rose. I haven't met the vineyard manager, uh, but evidently uh, they work very closely together. And, you know, Pusey Vale is not owned, I had to ask this question, by Yolamba, though uh, Luisa makes the wines at both and actually made her original reputation on um, Viognier because she makes, uh, you know, some of the most consistently highly regarded um, Viognier in the world, period. And that includes a really inexpensive uh, Viognier that you'll, uh, that's very excessively priced. So I'm, I'm going to throw a question to Tim. You're, you're the science bent master sommelier, I, I like to think. Um, we've got a great question here yes, from yeah. Andrea Hoffman about why there are so much, it seems like there's a lot of legs, even though it's a low alcohol wine. So can you kind of relate to what's driving legs in, uh, in the wine glass? Yeah, sure. That's a great question. And uh, <clears throat> if you think about what creates, uh, for lack of a better term, viscosity in wine, it's usually residual sugar. More often than not, it's alcohol, higher alcohol, or it's a geeky term that's called dry extract. And dry extract just means particulate matter in solution. And in this case, you've got a really old vineyard. Um, you know, the, here, you know, a lot of these vines were planted in 1960 or 61. And so you've got a vineyard that's 50 plus years old. It's not giving you a lot of grapes, probably less than a ton to acre. And so you're getting, you've got smaller grapes, more skin, less pulp. So you have more particulate matter, more stuff in the must. And when you ferment it out, it means that, you know, the, the wine is just gonna be richer, even though it doesn't have alcohol. And that's really the sign of quality. And unless you filter it out, the wine's just gonna be richer. Mm -hmm. And even here, it's got really high acid. Yeah, beautiful stuff. Boy, also, I will echo, say. Echo, yeah, echo Madeline's comments. Uh, Louisa Rose is a rock star. Um, you know, Yolumba owns more Viognier and makes more Viognier than anyone on the planet. And she does it as well as anyone. And that includes the Northern Rhone in France. So rock star. So it says unfiltered? I don't think so. Uh, no, this is no. Well, no, it's just it goes through polish, finding, and filtration. I'm saying my comment, getting back to what I said, the, the way you get rid of high dry extract is to filter the wine heavily. And that just takes every time you filter wine, it takes more stuff out. So, yes, this is lightly fine and filtered, but the wine in and of itself, really high quality grapes, old vineyards, low yield, just a richer wine. Those of you who like to take notes the way I do, Tim has said stuff twice. And if he can say it, we can say it. I just want to. <laughs> I just want to say that. Also, I have a, I have a quote, I have a quote from tongues. Louisa Rose. Louisa Rose said she drinks more Riesling than any other variety. So though she may have her her reputation hanging on uh, Viognier. Look yeah. what's you know. Up. You know they call her the Queen of Viognier, and that's not just an Australian right, um, so. name for her. That's that literally carries the world. If, if people who are in the uh, Viognier world, they always talk about the queen. The queen is is Louisa. Uh, yeah, this is a. I love it just because you know to Tim's point, some of these vineyards in the re I mean they don't pick 1961 out of a Cracker Jack box and arbitrarily call it that way. There are vines uh, in that uh, contoured vineyard that you saw there that go back to 1961. Uh, I do think it's also important. By the way, first vintage of this was was uh, 17. So this is not. Um, a wine they've made year in and year out. So it's uh, they've always made Riesling, but they haven't made the 1961 block until they isolated it a handful of years ago. Um, I, I think it's really important because I'm going to carry the theme over when you think about wine too momentarily, that vine age is really important for weight, texture, and depth. Um, that younger vines may give you, you know, like literally the first year um, grapes get put out from a vineyard, particularly true with Pinot Noir, I find, you can use that fruit 
um, and it'll actually be quite lively and kind of bright, albeit a little bit simple. But then things sort of shut down until the vines get old enough and mature enough to, to have something to say. Um, in that regard, maybe like some people, uh, that they need to be older and mature and all that. But I think wines, of uh, particularly lighter bodied wines, not necessarily big reds uh, per se, definitely develop depth, breadth, texture, extraction, um, and uh, volume, if you will, as the vines get older. And the other question I just wanted to add in really quickly, um, liquid lime juice is kind of how I think of Eden Valley Riesling. You know, if you get, um, well, I guess most lime juice is liquid, isn't it? But just extract of lime. So whoever had mentioned that earlier as being sort of a clue, Madeline, maybe it was you. That to me, if I'm sitting there and I'm kind of in the world of Riesling and it's expressively limey, um, that's usually a, a reasonable clue there. Although with climate changes things you know change around a little bit maybe not one to wrap your head on and lastly uh the whole tdn thing the petrol thing the chateau exxon uh 20 uh, or 87 or 91 um is usually due to um the fruit getting exposed to sunlight and as you can imagine they have a lot of sun in australia perhaps more so than many places in uh uh, Europe and the Palatine in, in Germany and in Austria and all that. And if your, your son gets there, it sort of activates a lot of things that give you that in concert with clone in concert with other things. It's not necessarily desirable, right? So people have been um, playing with their canopies to shield the fruit more so they can play it down. It will appear as wines get older, almost uniformly, but when it's young, it's not necessarily considered the high attribute than it is when it's old. Tim, you're the Riesling man. Is that accurate? I, yeah, I have absolutely. to. I'm going to play my role as the timekeeper. We're going to go on to the next wine. And I'm going to remind our panelists, we have to get through six wines. So we're going to keep this moving. And we do have a happy half hour for those who have additional questions. We love to have your questions. Remind me to talk about Riesling and food. I'll do it yes, in the happy half absolutely. hour. Absolutely. Yes. All right, Evan, we're on to you. Wine number two, interesting color. Yeah, dark, darker color. A darker color right off the bat can be essentially um, uh, driven by a couple of things. One, it could be that the wine spent some time in wood. One, wines that have spent time in wood, particularly smaller wood, will develop darker colors. Number two, it could be older. As wines get older, particularly white wines, they tend to darken as the fruit slowly but surely um, through the OTI of the, of the cork, if you will, um, oxidizes. And then um, thirdly, it could just be because of skin contact. You know, if you actually made the wine in the contact of uh, the fruit skins itself, like you see today in orange wines and, and a number of things like that. But its darker color is certainly apparent and something that I want to hold on to there. As I swirl the glass around, talking about Madeleine's, this wine has a little bit more weight and generosity um, in its texture. And for those of you who do look at the legs there, those legs are falling a little bit slower and are a little bit thicker. Um, as you know, if you go onto the website, you go into our our, our grids, you can find every last um, iota of information and descriptors there, and you can get very carried away. But for what we're doing today and for our purposes, and when I simply taste wines for the purposes of expression, I always just look for a few things. Few for yourself is a wonderful acronym to remember for fruit, earth, and wood. And if you can speak to a few uh, characteristics about a wine in those three categories, you're going to provide more information than anybody is ever going to want to know. Fruit for me sort of goes off and does not only fruit fruit, and in the case of fruit, it could be tropical fruit, it could be tree fruit, it could be orchard fruit, it could be citrus fruit, whatever, um, red fruits, black fruits, and all that, but anything else that grows. So that also is kind of, although they're not fruits, I sort of, when I think of fruit, I also think of herbs. I also think of vegetables. I think of things that grow out of the ground and kind of lump them together. Earthiness is what we talk about as either being um, organic earth, like potting soil or freshly turned dirt or forest floor or, or humus or things like that, or inorganic earth, which is more stones, rocks, slates, flints, and things like that. What you'll find generally in wine is wines either have it or they don't. It's If you have to look too hard, it's either probably not there or um, probably not a major portion of the wine, which might give you the clue to the styles of wines. In general, old world wines are more earth expressive, new world wines are more fruit expressive. So going back to that first wine, even though there was a mineral component to it, it was really that screaming limey citrus that drove that wine forward. So you can't have minerality, but if it plays a significant backseat to the fruit, 
yeah, you're probably going to be more in the new world. And then finally, wood. You know, wood can take um, the form of either texture. Um, if it's older wood, it could take the form of providing interesting um, flavors of uh, spices, particularly baking spices, sweet spices and such, or it can be more along the lines of, of uh, as they bend the oak over barrels, like that torrified molasses, burnt sugar, caramel, all those other things. So quickly through this one, um, I am getting a lot of fruit here. Uh, it tends to be in that sort of apple vein, apple pear vein. Um, some of it is ripe. Some of it is slightly overripe and some of it is underripe, but it's all really there. I'm not getting so much citrus. I may be getting a little hint of uh, a soft tropicality there, maybe some uh, very underlying, um, slightly unripe mango, slightly unripe pineapple, like those green mango salads you get in uh, certain South Asian restaurants. You pick up that character there with the brightness and the sharpness from being slightly underripe. I'm not getting a lot of earthiness here, although there, one could argue there's a, a little sense of, uh, of turned dirt here or fresh earth. I'm certainly not getting any strong minerality. And although I'm not getting a lot of oak per se, I'm looking at that color and I am noticing an oxidative element there. Remember that, that wine breathes through oak that it may be in, regardless of size, that might suggest to me that if there is oak here, it's either older or larger or in combination thereof with stainless steel and other things. So there's things here that suggest it's certainly that nuttiness that I'm getting, that sort of slightly almondy, slightly soft marzipan-y character that, I, that I'm picking up there. In the palate, and again, as Madeline said before, palate and nose are connected, not only through the retronasal passage in your throat, but if you've had a cold, you know you can't taste. Echo, 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 validation, validation, validation. One of the things I think is more important here is in addition to those flavors we talked about, which are a little subtler in the mouth than they are in the nose is a texture, is a roundness, is as the French would say, sort of a gras or a fat to the wine. And I think that's implicitly part of what this wine's personality is about, as well as how it's made and how it's vinified. It's uh, It's got, dare I say, a roundness, smoothness, not creaminess per se. Uh, the acid is very balanced and style there. It carries the wine through. It's not nearly as sharp as the wine that we had with Madeline, but it's also richer and thicker, which suggests to me that it's probably higher alcohol. So as we look through these quick three questions here before we uh, figure out where we're going. Um, is this wine dry or fruity? Um, it's definitely dry, but it's also fruity. So remember that, that fruity doesn't mean sweet, right? Fruity means the presence of fruit. So this wine is at once dry, i.e. no residual sugar and fruity. There are some floral notes here to it, but it's really more peaches. And it's really more, I said, in that apple-y, pearish vein. And I would say more yellow and brown, probably than green, sort of in that sweeter, riper style. And the texture we talked about, creamy, round, um, quite pleasant, and the acid balanced for so we're able to address some of those questions here. Um, uh, the only other things I would add from the standpoint of, um, of, uh, of physical characteristics, I am getting just a touch of bitterness, which would suggest to me that maybe this wine did see some skin contact. Remember, not only do you pull color and flavor out of grape skins, but you would pull some tannins there too. So in the words of wine geeks, the wine has a soft phenolic character. We don't describe white wines as being tannic, we describe them as being phenolic. So you have a little bit of that there, but it's really driven by its texture, its perfect balance, its beautiful flavor, which I think is also echoed texturally and flavor depth wise by age of vines. So any questions, Lee Manger, do we wanna jump into where we are? Uh, I think we've got plenty of guesses from Alsatian Pinot Gris, mm -hmm. Oregon Pinot Gris, I love it. Um, I think you've given a lot of clues, so I think we can move ahead. All right, so let's uh, get back on Google Earth. I'm gonna hold the table so I don't get car sick. I don't like these types of virtual reality programs. Not fun at soaring at Disneyland, but we are out of Europe. We're in the, out of Australia. We're in the States and we are specifically in Oregon, Oregon, and specifically in the Willamette Valley, not too far away from Portland. And we are sitting in the estate vineyards of um, one of the patriarch, matriarch, familial first wineries of Oregon. And that of course is the Irie Vineyard owned by the Lett family um, who have owned this winery for uh, decades and decades. I wanna say getting moving towards 60 years now. Um, the Irie Vineyard is located specifically in the Dundee Hills. For those of you 
who note um, all of these sub appellations of the Willamette Valley there are shown. Uh, we talk about it collectively as Willamette Valley, but that's like saying Sonoma County or Napa Valley. The more exploration you do, the more specific uh, attributes you can learn about these individual areas. And Dundee is different than uh, Yamhill Carton, is different than the Chehala Mountains, McMinnville, et cetera, et cetera. You can learn a lot about this if you go through the Pino kits, by the way, in our uh, Pino series in Oregon that we did before. But Irie is, um, is a fundamental winery there. And dare I add, the first winery, are you sitting down, the first winery to plant Pinot Gris commercially in this country. So these wines were planted some 50 years ago, and these are still young, um, the original vines. Obviously, some of the vines have been, uh, have died off and they've repropagated them here, but the longer, the lion's share of these come off these old vines that David Lett, uh, Jason Lett's father, uh, planted when he got up there and everybody else followed from there. So there was no Pinot Gris per se planted commercially in California, very little planted in Oregon. Now it's um, literally the number two grape after uh, Pinot Noir. And although it's been getting a little bit of a white run for its money recently from some of the Chardonnays that are coming out here, it still is the signature white to the signature red of Pinot Noir in the state. Uh, Jason Lett, who's really carried the uh, family torch further, um, has incredible respect not only to his vineyard, um, he's a very, um, you know, th this stuff is liquid gold. I mean, to me, it is, um, you know, Cali uh, America's first Pinot Gris. And for those people that picked Alsace, um, I don't think that's a bad call. Alsace shares that textural roundness and richness where it differs, of course, is when you go to Northeastern Italy, where it's cooler and you don't get quite as much sun and the wines have that racier, more acidic, leaner, brighter uh, character. Whereas Pinot Gris, um, Gris versus Grigio tends to speak specifically to wines that are rounder, riper, more in the Alsace vein. And in the case of Oregon, this is really an Oregonian style because, you know, some of the Pinot Gris that are from up there tend to be a little bit more like Italy, some tend to be a little bit more like Alsace. And I generally consider Oregon to be kind of the tweener between the two. Um, just lovely stuff, all about apples, pears, a little bit of melons and tropicality and, you um, uh, beauty. This wine will, by the way, age quite well uh, for probably about five to eight years and um, maintain its texture. We'll maintain the acidity, which is balanced now, but hold on, it will still be there later. Uh, it will certainly pick up a little bit more oxidation, but I think that's part and parcel for a wine like this. Um, I want to overstate the, the obvious yeah. for deduction mm -hmm. reasons. When you taste a wine like this and it's telegraphing youth on the nose and the palate and you see that color, what color is Pinot Gris? You know, so when you see a little bit of a pink tinge um, in a white wine that's fresh and it doesn't have overt oxidative notes, it may be something you want to consider. Also, to Evan's terrific point, this has a lushness, especially in um, relief to wine number one. You know, you can compare them to try to get your own handle on acidity levels, alcohol levels, mouthfeel that we're describing a lot. And there's something very lush about this wine. And also Evan spoke to its perfect balance. This wine can handle bottle age, but it doesn't need bottle yeah. age. So it's Madeline, I, I, let me ask the dumb question of the day. So I love them. So the color you're saying, the copper tinge that Christy was talking about is not necessarily from oak it is actually from because the Pinot skin Gris of the grape red, variety red grapes absolutely so for those out there who are not sure of this mm -hmm. it's 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 easy to um forget that Pinot Gris Pinot Grigio is with uh red skins it's not yeah, it's, it, it's not uncommon you know let's put it this way the simple stupid way or innocent way I should say so we don't use the word stupid that um, when you know you see a Pinot Gris or Pinot Grigio that is absolutely no color at all, they intentionally gave it, you know, probably gave it no skin contact. Also, that's further um, reinforced here with the phenolic white wine tannin mouthfeel. You know, the little fur tongue uh, evidence. Yeah, and and to Madeline's point and to, to Christie's point, also the grapes themselves naturally, if left to their own, will take on a pink slash gray hue to them, which is then um, reinforced when you allow the extract to start pulling out of the skins and the wine becomes that way. So the grapes themselves, gris simply means gray, remember, or grigio mm -hmm. means gray there too. So it's not a pure classic quote unquote white wine 
in that regard. But uh, um, isn't it cool to be tasting the oldest vine Pinot Gris in America? In the United States. Did you see that wonderful comment from Kristen? Um, uh, she was surprised that this was a new world wine. So, you know, uh, the Irie Vineyard thanks you. Um, you know, I think part of what you're tasting is uh, age of vine and complexity, don't you think, Tim? Yes, absolutely. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. All right. We're actually going to go to Tim. Oh, here's Jason. I love uh, these pictures. Thank you. I love Ed, Jason. He's together. such a cool guy. Is he David's son? He is David's son. Yeah. Very cool. Beautiful vineyards. All right, Tim, on to you. Okay. All right, everybody. Now for the first red wine. Uh, let's take a look at these questions before we start. Uh, what does the translucent color tell you about the red grape variety? Okay, translucent meaning that you can see through it. Yeah. And you get an impression of rocky earth or stony quality. Well, that's an if question, and we'll see. Or of turned dirt or potting soil. Um, Obviously, the first one is all about minerality, and the second one is earth. We'll see if we've got that in wine three. And you believe this is a cooler climate wine or a warmer climate wine. And we're going to discover that too. All right, so everybody, let's take, you know, wine number three. First of all, you know, and I, and I just alluded to this, you can read through it, right? So that points to the fact that whatever this wine was made from in terms of grapes, it's a thinner skin, lighter pigmented grape. Yeah. Uh, second of all, the color, interesting, is a little bit advanced. So instead of being red, it's reddish brown, which is garnet, right? But there's certainly a lot of red. It fades out to um, you know, kind of a garnet rim, reddish brown, lighter one, yeah, more evolved. And just a quick pointer, the, you know, the rim edge, meniscus, whatever you call it, in a wine will always be more evolved in color than the body, the core of the wine, okay? What else can we say about this? No staining of the tears. And the tears, legs, marangoni, whatever you want to call it, are solid medium. Okay. And then let's go ahead and smell it and taste it, please. Okay. On the nose, the wine is clean. It's really sound. It's well made. Uh, it's red fruit dominant. <clears throat> and that really is uh, an extension of the color. And this may be my own theory, but if you've got a red wine with this little color, odds are, you know, the grapes are grown in a cooler climate. So there may not be a lot of alcohol. Acid could be higher. Also, the fruit tends to be red and tart. We'll see if that's true. And for me, what I smell in this is primarily cranberry, sour cherry, underripe strawberry, things like that. So tart red fruit. I don't smell any black fruit and no blue fruit, certainly. Okay. Uh, in terms of non-fruit, there's quite a bit here. First of all, if you pull your nose out of the glass, about half an inch, so I like that. It smells like dried roses and maybe, um, you know, uh, almost like vitamin C, yeah? And what else? There's black tea, there's orange rind, dried orange peel, orange rind, uh, you know, and then various herbal type things. It reminds me of bay leaves, chervil, uh, some verbena, maybe even a little lemongrass. Um, and then in terms of the earth mineral thing, if I smell it again, yeah, I mean, what, there's, there's a sum of both. There is a hard stone quality and a mushroom turned soil, but I don't think it's uh, center stage in the wine. I'm not convinced. There is, however, oak, and the oak makes its known, presence known in terms of spices, uh, things like clove, you know, a little bit of nutmeg, uh, what else, vanilla, and maybe even a little coffee. Okay, um, and then on the palate, the wine is medium body. It's very streamlined. If I go to the structure of the alcohol is medium. And by the way, the way I check for alcohol is after, this is very important, after you spit out the wine or swallow it, you say, oh, and inhale. And for me, I get some heat right here and then it stops. So this alcohol on this, and I don't, this is important too, I don't equate it to a hard number in the bottle, mainly because wineries lie. <laughs> because the more alcohol, the more they have to pay the IRS and taxes, all right? So this, I think, is around 13%. 
And, and that makes sense because the next thing is the acidity and it's elevated. It's certainly not as high as the Riesling. If you go back to the Riesling, that's high acid because you feel it on the enamel of your teeth. This, however, salivary glands are working, medium plus. Uh, the tannin is medium, if that. And I just want to point out again that you have a red wine with not a lot of color, with really tart red fruit, not a lot of alcohol, but elevated acidity. And all those things work together. Uh, the finish is persistent. It's long, uh, really beautiful, well-made wine and a good example of what it is. So let's see what it is, shall we? Hold on one second. We're just going to give everybody a, a quick... Okay. Uh, chance to put in any guesses really quiet maybe it's the first red wine and they needed a little warm-up tip uh, but we've got now some New Zealand Pinot Noir Sangiovese uh, for those of you who know that we used to do polls in the past we're trying this method trying to do something new uh, might go back to polls for certain things but Oregon Pinot uh, very very hard pressed to find Evan choosing two organs in one kit uh, I'll give you that clue. All right, let's see unless what it is. Unless by design, unless by design. <laughs> unless by design. <laughs> but I also just wanted for those people who are sitting there and they're they're spontaneously combusting because we're not doing three whites and three reds and we're doing four reds and two whites. Please note that I composed this kit when it was much colder and I didn't want to drink much white wine. <laughs> mm, yeah. So actually, you know, I don't I don't think the the pin on the map is in it may not be in the right place because um, this particular vineyard is in Nelson and not near uh, Christchurch. So it's a low up, the lower Moratari Valley, which is near Nelson. And uh, let's reveal. So this is Mount Beautiful Winery uh, in Moatari. It, um, you know, the David Teese is the owner, the mine behind. Uh, his family came from England in 1860s. Uh, and the area really until about 40 years ago was, you know, dairy cattle and farming sheep. And now, of course, at certain elevations, it's one of the new hot places for Pinot Noir. Uh, this particular wine is, you know, the, the vineyards are planted to both uh, Burgundy clones, 777 and 666. There's also a couple of UC Davis clones. And uh, there are 23 separate lots, uh, vineyard lots that go into the Pinot Noir for this winery. They're all at different elevations, all above the frost line, which is good in terms of ripening and letting the fruit stay on for as long as possible. Something most people don't know is that, you know, New Zealand, South Island has one of the longest growing seasons outside of say, you know, Argentina than anywhere in the planet. And also a lot of days of sunshine. So we think about heat ripening grapes, well, sunlight more than anything uh, ripens grapes, hence, and I think this, Maddie, was, may have been on your slide. How can you have a wine that has ripe characteristics with tart yes, characteristics? thank you. You have a cool climate with a really long growing season, and that's how. Okay. And you have that uh, in the Eden Valley, too, right? Yeah, Central Otago would have, well, more like relatively a little bit higher alcohol. Yeah, not that much. And then Martinborough, most people don't know, is where the first Pinot Noir vineyards were planted in New Zealand quite a long time ago. Okay. Yeah, just comments. another thought. Just, uh, I was going to make just one comment here. Uh, two things that I think are very instrumental about this wine and, and a beautiful job, as always, Tim, of describing it. First of all, Pinot Noir and color. I always tell people, forget about it, right? I have seen some of the most anemic looking wines being the most delicious and flavorful wines there. And then I've had the wines that are the darkest and deepest and people are most excited about them. And they're, they're the most boring or whatever. In fact, the first time I ever experienced those now um, ubiquitous black glasses or cobalt blue glasses was in Burgundy uh, decades ago tasting. And the person, I mean, not to say that it wasn't dark in his cellar to begin with, but he really wanted to show me how unimportant color was to the personality of the wine. So we tasted through all these wines and did that. And then we brought them back out and poured literally from one glass to the other. And many of the wines were, were almost absent of any pigmentation whatsoever. And Pinot Noir is genetically de deficient in two pigment chromosomes that all other red wine grapes have. So it's never in concert with cooler climate going to develop that, um, that color extract unless you throw in a little bit of mega purple or Syrah or something like that to make it happen. The other thing that I, I thought was lovely about this wine is it really is a tilt of the hat 
to the elegant side, to the subtle side of what Pinot Noir is all about. You know, I think we're becoming increasingly um, aware, whether it's due to climate change, region or whatever, of bigger, more robust styles of Pinot Noir, whether it's coming from the heart of, you know, the middle reach of Russian River Valley or warmer vintages up in Oregon or whatever. But Pinot Noir at its heart is an elegant wine, is a subtle wine. Um, and when I first tasted this wine blind, I was reminded of sort of a more elegant style of a Cote du Bon, say like a Montelli or something like that, more than I was, you know, uh, your sort of classic quote unquote new world Pinot. Well, Not to that sense. point, I think Robert uh, had, uh, um, you know, was thinking it might be a Bourgogne Rouge and that's not far off. You also have a complexity and an earthiness to the swine um, that can make you consider that absolutely. And I wanna, by, by the way, if there were at least two people who were considering Sangiovese, do not beat yourself up. This wine has a very, if you look at the palate, get the aromatics out of the way. It has a beautiful tension between acidity and actually not inconsiderable tannin for Pinot that brings Sangiovese to mind. So you can see why in deducing it's, you know, it's so many elements, the color can set you free, the palette can maybe push you in a different direction. Um, so I wanted to mention that um, as well. I, I, I second Madeline's uh, thought about don't be discouraged. Um, mm -hmm. This is why we have tools that allow you to mix and match because you have, we have in here, we're not differentiating people who have been tasting for many, many years um, many, and many. are nailing it. What Christy and, uh, you know, others, Andrea and others are doing here, um, that's not, you guys are really good at tasting. So if you didn't get that, don't feel like, oh my gosh, I'm lesser, less worthy. This is a, this is a difficult thing to do. Um, Tim, I'm going to throw this out. Here's a good question. Andrea says she's getting a strong vinyl um, on the nose. Are you getting that? Is that a correct observation in your mind? Uh, no, you know what there is, and I did mention it, there is, uh, as we say in New Mexico, un poquito. So there's a little bit of volatile acidity, VA, mm -hmm. and, you know, she may be very sensitive to it. So, Okay, guys, we're going to move to the next wine. Um, uh, we, I think as we move, Tim, if you can address Kristen's uh, question here, the main markers for this wine that pointed you to New Zealand just to summarize wine three. Sure, you know, well, let me do this really quickly. So, so Kristen basically, Pinot Noir because red fruit dominant and to Evan's point, very elegant wine. A lot of secondary things, rose floral, tea, uh, all the herbal notes, uh, very slight earth and mineral to me, uh, especially when you compare, you know, <laughs> compare it to the other red wines in the flight, let's say, or some of them. And uh, the use of oak, but, uh, you know, moderate tannins, elegant, charming, finesse, you know, that's all Pinot Noir to me. So, and, her and now is something on the TV for something completely different. Yeah. But why New Zealand? Uh, why New Zealand? You know, to me, the, the secondary qualities and the tart quality of the fruit, um, more than anything, you know, why didn't I take it to Oregon? There's just not enough fruit and it's not rich enough, you know, yeah. so. Okay, wine number four, everybody. Hmm. Okay, looking at this, everybody, if you tilt the glass forward, we've got more depth of color, but you know what? The color is not dissimilar from wine number three. So it is garnet. It's some oxidation here. It appears some evolution, especially look at the edge of rim. It's almost a mahogany brown and orange. Hmm. So oxidation in red wine mean it's either old or it's been an extended time in oak usually, or, you know, you could have very oxidative winemaking, meaning that the wine sees a lot of air during fermentation and uh, even the aging, okay? All right, in terms of the nose, <laughs> can we just say, my goodness. <laughs> oh, there's a lot here to talk about. Um, where to start? Okay, so the fruit qualities, red dominates, but ripe, dried, almost resonated red fruit. And that equals the color, the oxidized color. So here you have sour red cherry. What else? Maybe red plum, pomegranate, rhubarb, even those, I think the people think those are vegetables. There is a hint of black fruit here, black plum. And again, it's dried, almost paste. Uh, but everything very rich, intense, focused, concentrated, but not fresh. Even the flowers, 
nose above the glass. It's dried rose petals and potpourri. All right, now we get into the other, and there's a lot of other. So starting with star anise, balsamic vinegar, which, okay, I'm gonna go all the way to the end, balsamic vinegar. Uh, who is it that got a little bit of vinyl on the, uh, on the Pinot Noir? Yeah. Who was that, Lee Man? Uh, that was Andrea Hoffman. And she's probably freaking out about this <laughs> because there is considerable volatile acidity on this wine and we will talk about it because it's important. Okay, what else is there? Uh, I said star anise, there is tea, um, there is, you know, dried leafy greens, um, you know, and then the earth and mineral thing is big. So you have a dusty quality, you have mushrooms, you have truffle, um, almost creosote tar, uh, turned earth, uh, baked soil, almost terracotta. And uh, again, it's a profoundly earthy wine. So for those of you out there in the listening audience, we're thinking that the Pinot Noir was from the old world. Now you have something to compare it against, okay? That's important. All right, there's also oak here, but generally speaking, it's mixed, meaning it's larger barrels or it's generally used. So there is not a lot of new oak influence. The influence that you smell and taste is generally like uh, almond skin, uh, bitter walnuts, um, things like that. Again, so not the small, expensive breaks. Okay, and then everybody, I want you to retaste it for science, okay, for the structure. Mm. And I am actually going to swallow a little bit. My goodness, that's grown up wine. <laughs> All right, why is it grown up? Because it's bone dry. And it's a very curious combination of high acid, high alcohol, and high tannin. Hmm. Okay. And now I don't know about you, but I the tannin in the front of the mouth is yeah, it grabs your attention. Okay. So obviously this wine desperately needs food, unless of course you know you like pirate wine. Okay. Uh, what else about it? I think we covered it. The finish is long. Uh, to me, this is by far the most complex wine thus far. The flight. And a wine that, you know, even though it looks old, probably not as old as you think, and it needs seven to 10 years in the cellar, or if you're going to pull it out and drink it, whatever you're going to pair it with has to have fat, protein, and salt to match those tannins. Okay. All right. With that, uh, Li Meng, what do you think? Uh, we've got a lot of Nabiolos in the mix here, which is exciting. Um, yep. I love this wine. I think... I, I love that people can see such breadth. Um, again, Evan, I'm always amazed by the choices um, and what a great selection so far. I, I love that. And for those of you who think I should know actually what's in all our kids, we make so many kids that I forget. So uh, great job, Evan. All right, let's go to where in the world. Italia. Northwestern uh, Italy, yay. Yeah, for those of you that called Nebbiolo, a uh, great call. And really one of my favorite places in the wine world. Um, this is Monte Beraldi. Uh, it's Barbaresco. This property, you know, was established in 1968. Uh, Luciano is the son, he took it over in 1994 and so as you would expect you know like many wineries in this area in Barbaresco they're making uh Moscato di Asti they're making Dolcetto they make three Barberas two of them are Cruz the OCGs they make five different uh Barbarescos and three of them are Cruz two have proprietary names and you know really there's a lot of parallels here between uh you know Barbaresco and Barolo and Burgundy in terms of crews and specific soil types and elevations really profoundly affecting the character of the wine. And, uh, you know, I would say that uh, Nebbiolo, to me, right behind Pinot Noir is my favorite grape and Sangiovese as well, the Nebbiolo, yeah. So fun stuff. Colleagues, 
Yeah, no, I was going to say, Tim, you know, I mean, you first talk of all, faster than I do. Too. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, but I think what's interesting here, and perhaps a good question, Tim, that you could riff on while you're on sort of the subject is, you know, for most of us, we sort of see three flavors, if you will, of, of Nebbiolo that come into the United States. We see Barbaresco, which we have here. We see Barolo, which we have here. And then we find that sort of Nebbiolo, Nebbiolo from Lange, Nebbiolo from here, Nebbiolo mm -hmm. from there. How how do Barolo and Barbaresco effectively differentiate themselves in your mind's eye and from your experience? And how might that be different than wine that is simply labeled Nebbiolo by virtue of the general geography it comes from? Yeah, those are good questions, Evan, too. I'm gonna answer the second one first. And, and you know, Lange Nebbiolo, uh, is usually declassified or younger vine stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's, if I can compare it to Germany, you know, it's an estate Riesling. So you're declassifying, you know, stuff from better vineyards, uh, younger vines. And more often than not, you know, the winemaking treatment is different. You know, a lot of stainless steel, cool fermentations, much softer tannins, easier to drink. <laughs> it's all relative. Uh, huh? Less cranky, if we <laughs> can say it that way. Uh, to me, the difference between Barolo and Barbaresco, and, and listen, any, anytime you make a statement like this, there's always an exception. So as soon as I say it, I'm going to make the exception, right? So Barolo, generally speaking, is a well is richer wine, usually slightly higher in alcohol, more earthy. Uh, Barbaresco, to me, relatively speaking, a little bit lighter, more elegant, definitely more red fruit centric more sandy, more mineral. And then of course, I think that Angelo Gaia's wines are Barbaresco. Mm, yeah. <laughs> you know, Tim, in that- They're monsters, in the, in the, they're huge. So, it, but uh, you know, that's painting very broad brush strokes. In the chat great. room, I just put, I would be hard pressed if you gave this to me blind, you know, and it's a happy dilemma to, to worry about whether you can tell the difference between Barbaresco and Barolo. A lot of times it's the year, a lot of times it's the producer and their um, production method. This is a pretty rich Barbaresco Gaia aside, but I thought there was one comment in the chat room that I loved. Somebody was going back and forth uh, and considering Alianico, which is, I adore Alianico. And yeah. I think um, Alianico, you know, to me edges closer to Brunello in terms of the quality of its tannins and the fact that it doesn't shut the wine down. This is hard tannin. You know, you actually yep. almost need that lamb chop to taste uh, what's yeah. on the palate unless you're very, um, you're very uh, practiced. And I also wanted to encourage everyone, if you're not getting the complexity, I mean, Tim put his nose in the glass and went, oh my God, what isn't there, right? But the reality yeah. is sometimes, you know, if you're not practiced at perceiving and defining, the um, complexity creeps up on you because sometimes I'll get, oh yeah, remember I said the TDN, hello, you know, <laughs> uh, because, <laughs> uh, regardless of whether you're practiced or not, sometimes the complexity reveals itself and parting shot on this wine, if you don't mind, Tim, you know, Nebbiolo is one of those really maddening little grapes that likes to fake you out and it can look young that little yellow or garnet rim when actually it, yep. it is, um, it can look like it's got bottle age when it actually doesn't have bottle age. So I'm just saying, thank you. Yeah, you know, I need to, I wanna circle back because remember I mentioned volatile acidity. Mm -hmm. So everybody here, you know, this these wines are traditionally made. They're using older, large barrels, slower fermentations, uh, extended time in these barrels. And, you know, these, this wine has quite a bit of volatile acidity. But, you know, what we call wine flaws, practically everything that's considered a wine flaw with the exception of TCA, corkiness, which is universally considered a fault, is contextual. And if you ran, if this much VA was in the New Zealand Pinot Noir, you know, there would be riots in the street, you know. And, but this is Barbaresco. And, you know, to an extent, that much VA is acceptable. And historically, that's what the wines are. So just keep that in the back of your mind that if you come across a wine that does have a lot of VA, and it is Grand Reserve of Rioja, or it's Amarone, or it's Barbaresco, or it's San Josef, you know, maybe that's part of the character of the wine. So, uh, and then who is it, Carlton? Real quick, Alianico would have much more color than this. And Nebbiolo shows oxidation really early on. So, Great. and there are the guys. Is that the Nebbia in the previous slide? Can you show that slide real quick, the, the fog? 
Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's the that's yeah. the fog right what there. Oh, shot. these are great pictures. That'd be a that be all low. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. All right. The uh, family, well, just the lineage there. You could see dad and mom, and then uh, son number one and son number two, and and all that's so yep. a family affair, as they say, and um, that's that's so nice to see. Um, and if you spend any time in, in Italy in general, certainly in Northern Italy, it is these patchworks of family, small operations um, that really are the, the heart and soul of everything. Um, yeah, it's great. And I just want to say for the novice out there who are, are so far away trying to determine between Barbaresco and Barolo like me, I'm just glad I got old world Italy. Yeah, right. there you so go. everybody How about don't take, worry about it. Yeah, How about enjoy the worry, but can out of the 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 deductions. How I, much I noticed stuff that you were very quiet. Have. Please Perfect. don't feel like yeah. you needed to nail Barbaresco here. And and All by right. the way, by the way, I just want to show one more visual for those of you who are who are this is your first kit, you're just getting started with this and you see all of these and they look that way and you're like, "Oh, how am I going to ever figure out if you turn it around?" And you see this sticker that says peel the reveal. Um, many times, if I don't feel like doing this to myself, I'll literally just peel this off and then reveal the identity of the wine on the back of the label for tasting. Number one, so I don't pour the wrong, wrong wine in the wrong glass if I'm leaving a, a tasting. And number two, sometimes knowing what it is actually helps you resonate and reaffirm the wine itself rather than not knowing what it is. Uh, because the other thing that I hope is true to all of you who have spent time with Master of the World is we curate these wines. So that Barbaresco was tasted in a flight of other Nebbiolos and other Barbarescos and um, told, picked, by us folk as being extremely representative of, of what it is. So the wines that you're gonna find are selected for their typicity and their character of being true to what they are as well as their quality. All right, so let's move on to wine five. I'm very, very excited about wine five. And um, right off the bat, we're not gonna to spend too much time here, but um, I think what's interesting that Tim sort of alluded to, and you can oftentimes get this a bit by looking at the wine. The wine is very red in appearance, um, closer to like what four and five were. Uh, generally going to be slightly cooler climate. Fruit character is going to be tartar and redder. And as the wines move to darker character, you're going to find more what we call, um, you know, literally, sometimes I call them, it's not onomatopoetic, but, but, you know, literally if it looks some way, it tastes some way. So the fruit character could be black or it could be blue. And if you look at this wine, wine five, in comparison to what we saw before, it does have a blacker, bluer, but more blacker character of fruit character there. So that's right off the bat. As far as when we smell it goes, you know, are you picking up any sort of minerality as part of this wine, whether it's again, organic earth or inorganic earth? I'm not gonna steer you one way or the other, but remember fruit, yes, earth, yes. And then of course, as I said before, the wood elements um, that will be in there. Never forget the word few, always address the three letters and people will always be impressed by what you have to say. And then lastly, we talk about wines oftentimes as having floral characters. So, you know, it could be blue and bluish flowers and lavender flowers and things like that. You could have citrus blossoms um, in white wines, but, but floral elements are often very evocative in wines. And I always look for them as part of that, for lack of better words, fruit character, again, organic growing things there. And you might want to ask yourself, am I finding any of those purple or bluer fruits in this wine? You might say yes. So let's go ahead and, and, uh, and give this wine a look. Right off the bat, um, as you try and read through your uh, any writing that might be in front of you, it definitely has more depth of color, more volume of color, less translucence than the first wines are there. I wouldn't call it per se opaque, but it's more opaque than the other wines were. It also has got a deeper, darker color, more of a deep ruby color. Uh, the rim is relatively consistent there, may be fading to just a kiss of purpley or pinky character, which usually refers to a wine having um, youth to it. You know, as the wines get more yellow garnet and all that stuff, as we saw with Tim's last wine, that could either be the grape variety in the case of Nebbiolo, or it could be age. As far as my fruit, earth, and wood goes, and as I swirl it, I've got some viscosity. And at least as they're moving down my glass, I get a little bit of staining in the tears themselves, which is again, common to both dry extract and uh, extract of the wine in general. My fruit character here, I'm getting tons of fruit, lots of black fruit strapping, almost fruit leatherish like in personality. For those of you who have kids and send them off to school with fruit leather, um, you get that character, you get a licorice to it, get some leafy 
uh, characters to it, maybe a little bit of tobacco or a little bit of, uh, of bay leaf or something like that. I'm picking up some earthiness here, a little bit of parched earth, sort of more of a kind of organic but dustier uh, style earth, maybe a little bit of terracotta in there. And then I'm picking up things that I'm picking up from, from uh, not so much oak, maybe it's the oak, maybe it's the personality of the grape. I'm not thinking it's oak per se, because I'm not getting a lot of the sweet spices or vanillins and that, but I am getting a sort of a smokiness here in this wine, which I, I think actually is probably part and parcel of the, of the grape itself. And then finally in the mouth, and I'm tasting more in the mouth, not so much to find new flavors and new flavor attributes, but to confirm, validate what I saw before, pick up anything new that I might've missed earlier, and now I am getting a little bit of sort of a blue and black floral character to this wine as well, but then also to measure the structural elements, which I can't really do anywhere else except in my mouth. Well, the wine is dry, but the fruit is ripe. Okay, so I'm not getting any lingering stuff there, but I've got a lot of sort of very concentrated, voluminous black fruit characters, maybe a little bit of black mission fig uh, in the palate, maybe a little bit of without the sweet spice elements, but more in that fruit leather, what I call fig Newton character there, along with again, a deep blackberry, black raspberry, uh, a lullaberry-ish character of fruit. Um, the earth is definitely sort of a, a, a drier, dustier uh, character of earth. The tannins on this wine are quite mild. If we're coming off of Tim's wine, which ripped my mouth up and was uh, cranky, as he liked to say, this wine is not cranky. It's very happy. The tannins are, are relatively smooth. They're present. They're there, but they've been extremely well managed. Uh, the wine has great length. The acidity level is relatively balanced. It's not shrill, uh, but it holds up all of the elements of the wine that are there. It's dry, um, although again, as I said, ripe, and the finish is, um, is pretty long. I mean, I can still taste it, and I'm tasting other things going on in the wine there, so it's actually somewhat expansive. Very different. Um, your brain's probably going in a lot of different directions. I'm seeing boatloads of varietal uh, options there. Um, and, and all of them have some merit. We can talk about them um, and go from there. Liman, back to you. I want Tim to be ready to answer if he likes this wine or not. You don't have to say it now, but I remember in my very first, many, many, many years ago, sitting in the CMS intro, and Tim gets up and he says, I don't like this variety. I'm just going to call you out. Um, and when we reveal it, I want you to tell me what you think of this variety. Well, he probably knows what it is, but hopefully he'll still be honest with us. <laughs> All right, let's yeah. see. So... Uh, we yeah, so let's we're let's everywhere. Move so let's we're, just go. I think we're all over the place. So we're we're going to land might surprise a lot of people. Um, and here we are in South Africa, and here we are specifically in Spartland, and here we are um, in the in the capable hands of a gentleman who I consider, if if Louisa Rose is the queen of Viognier, then Aubrey Bieslar is the king of Pinotage. Not only does he make his own wine. Uh, which we'll talk about momentarily here in the coastal region. And again, getting closer, if you will, the coastal region's big, if you look at that map on the left. And then as you move into it on the right, you'll notice that it's in the area to the west. So it actually does have, if you will, protracted but minor. Nevertheless, their maritime influence to protect some of the acidity and moderate the, the season. So it's a little bit um, longer. But Aubrey um, is also the winemaker for Kanenkopf. And Kanenkopf is um, undeniably the benchmark in, in all of Yes, say it, breathe, Pinotage. So this is um, the first Pinotage that we have ever uh, had in Master of the World. It will not be the last, but for those of you who are not fans of Pinotage, you will not be getting one every month. Uh, but I, I do think that this one shows an understanding of a couple of things. Number one, understanding of source. Uh, this comes from literally the largest contiguous Pinotage vineyard in the world located in Svartland. The vines are all bush trained, uh, 20 years old, um, moderate to lower um, yields as the wine has great concentration on it. And Pinotage, as many of you know, certainly those of you who are studying as a grape is not a natural grape. It's a, it's a hybrid, it's a, a crossed grape. So half of the parentage is Pinot Noir, 
half of the parentage is sans sub. And the reason why this grape was developed was to get the pedigree, if you will, of a grape like Pinot Noir, which can make amongst the most complex and interesting wines in the world, but the uh, workhorse ability that sans so can give you in terms of being able to crop amply, uh, provide um, volume, et cetera. So you put the two of them together and it can be interesting. Now, to Tim's comment earlier at one point said that Pinotage is, is undeniably the worst wine in the world. Pinotage is pretty much relegated to South Africa. Yes. And as you remember, it was like not really that long that. ago. <laughs> it was not that long ago when Pinotage was essentially illegal. You know, they you were not able to buy South African wines and outside of selling them to the UK, all South African wine was essentially consumed in South Africa. When you're drinking your own wine, not Kool-Aid, but wine all the time, you tend to fall in love with the attributes that are there. And some of these attributes are positive, you know, the, the color, the fruit, some of it, it can be a little bit negative. They've been occur they've been known in the past for having some idiosyncratic uh, flavors that range from medicine to burnt tires to everything else in between. And if you continue, if you always do what you always did, you'll always get what you always got. But today's Pinotage in 2020, at the top level, of Taj, of Bieslar, of Pinot Wolf, of Kanenkopf, et cetera, um, are really Pinot Noir when it's vinified at its best, showing uh, the softer uh, side of the tannins, the beautiful depth of fruit, the smokiness and complexity, <clears throat> the leaves, the licorice, the dark fruit, but without the burn, you know, the, the spinning donuts, rubber tire thing that we used to get, or dare I say, in some cases, when Pinot Taj is um, not true to itself, um, you know, verging on roadkill, it can be sometimes. Uh, but this is a, a superb one. And, and my, I think that, you know, they actually have a top 10 South African Pinotage contest every year, where all these judges come up and literally select the top 10 in the country. And if you follow it, and you can get your hands it's available online to see the results of the of the competition. Any of those wines will change your mind. Um, all right, and you need to let blood. Tim get in here. I see all right, Tim. There you go. Tim, go. Okay. Well, first of all, we got we got to hand Christy, uh, you know, uh, a shout out for a really uh, picturesque description of uh, Pinotage. So you got to read it. It's in the comments. So I have to be Inigo Montoya here because of time and sum up. Uh, remember the Lord of the Rings movies, Fellowship of the Ring. I went into the theater prepared to hate those movies and in 10 minutes loved it. Peter Jackson nailed it. And I've read those books probably 15 plus times. So I know him pretty well. But the Galadriel at the beginning of the first movie says, what does she say? The world is changing. It's the first <laughs> thing anyone says in the movies. And that's what we have to say about Pinotage. Uh, actually, Christy, your description, some of the wines were worse. They involved a lot of personal body odor terroir, a barbecue, cutting your finger, burning rubber, all sorts of stuff. But there, there were problems in the vineyards, family for all, reduction in the winery. They really didn't understand the grape very well, I don't think. And to Evan's point now, I think there are some really good wines made. So for those of us that were brought up on the rusticity of the wines, you know, uh, you know the best wines are completely different animals. So there, so I stand corrected. <laughs> And there's there's Aubrey in the back, and and I would just you know encourage people to explore uh, this this grape a little bit more. And again, you know, it, it, it's in the old adage of have you driven a Ford lately? You know, have you had a Pinotage recently? Yeah. And there are some lovely ones yeah. there. There's not a lot of it outside of South Africa. There's a couple of people who play with it in California, a couple of other obscure parts of the world, like New Zealand, uh, Australia, a little bit. But really, South Africa is its home, it's its provenance, it's its personality, and all of that. And as they have learned more about, you know, how to best work with it, it's great. It's interestingly that the two grapes that we initially hated the most out of South Africa have been completely re reinvented and reimaged, and that is yep. Chenin Blanc. And if you can find old vine Chenin Blanc and Pinotage, and if you can find old vine Pinotage, those are per ton the most expensive grapes in all of South Africa today. Yeah, this is carried by Broadbent, so I would imagine that it would uh, start being more ubiquitous and able to find it. Uh, David, if you go to our own website, we do have a buy link uh, to Wine Searcher that helps you look for it. Um, Tim, in all fairness, not to date myself, but that was more than 15 years ago that I remember you saying that. So <laughs> you are allowed to change your mind after 15 sure. years. All right. On Unless you're running next. for political office, then you can't. <laughs> right? Then it's every five minutes. 
Right. Yeah. All right. So last one. I think Madeline, we're back to you. Yes. And you will notice I didn't even try to interject on this one. <laughs> I knew it was like hopeless, but I will say, you know what the, my takeaway is, by the way, those of you, whether you had, you know, a minute of experience or 40 years of experience, you know, I really pay attention to the wine and the wine is the best teacher. This is a teaching example of don't let your mind get in the way of assessing quality. Um, you know, and this is where blind tasting comes into great, um, is a great tool for keeping yourself honest with your, you know, when you approach the wine, because every Beesler wouldn't mess around with Pinotage if it wasn't worth making. And it is, I think, a great variety that's absolutely a divining rod for great versus, you know, uh, subpar viticulture, winemaking, age of vines, you name it. You know, um, obviously there's quality potential. So yay for picking it, Evan Bravo. I don't think you should feel defensive in the least, but Tim should. I'm anyway. a good up, yeah. <laughs> I'm teasing. All right, wine number six. Let's go. Wine number six. Okie dokie. So um, we are looking at the beautiful color. And this is an example of a wine um, that is not showing oxidation on the rim. Go to the very rim first and you'll notice that the rim has actually violet or purple tones to it. And the center... If you paint, put your pink, put your finger on it, you certainly can't read through it, but you can almost see the shadow of your finger. So it is telling us what that it is from a grape variety that is not thin skinned, um, but is not um, necessarily tiny and very thick skinned and blue black. So note to self, the appearance always gives you a hint of what's to come and it appears to be young. It moves in the glass. Um, you know, with some weight, and also it is showing a little bit of the stain, um, though probably not as prominent as the one on wine number five. So again, that reinforces the stuff, the extract, but also the use of the wine aromatically. And on the palate, I love the smell of this wine. It actually smells young, the way it looks young. It just smells of primary fruit. In my experience with this wine, um, Dominantly red, but black and a little bit of blue right on the heels. So mixed berry fruit and mostly fresh and beautifully ripe. And also there's a gorgeous lavender and violet expression in this wine that I would think is more fresh than dried. And I'm going to take it right on my palate and try to power through. Uh, I know we've got our, um, our happy half hour coming in. Mm. I swallowed it with the help. You know, um, the texture of the weight is, you know, medium to medium full. The tannins are, I would call them, um, you know, well-mannered but drying, certainly not Nebbiolo tannins. What's really a surprise to me is the freshness of the acidity. It's palate cleansing, mouth watering. It's lovely. It actually is a surprise, but it adds to the intrigue of this wine. And the fact that it's showing young in terms of describing the flavors, I know I mentioned, um, you know, red fruit, you know, you could go ripe and sour cherry, um, you know, and plum followed by, um, you know, a touch of black and blue fruits. There is another aspect, both aromatically and on the palate, that is, uh, you know, two or three down the line. My brain always perceives and defines, gets it out of the way so I can get another impression of dried herbs. Um, and also a little bit of um, a veggie component that's more fennel and olive. We're not talking bell pepper, we're not talking pyrocene, but it adds a great um, uh, whisper of complexity to a wine that's quite young. A little bit of a pepper, spice, pi pepper and spice um, element, though it's not wood to me. There is some evidence of oak on this, but it's modest. There's a light touch to it. You don't get a wall of sweet baking spices and um, vanilla, um, olive, herb de Provence, violets, rose, beautiful aromatically, and it's swelling. You know, this is the kind of wine that you'd want to, you know, play with it over a couple of hours. In terms of um, texture, it's both, by the way, and this seems to be the theme of this tasting, ripe and refreshing. So you have, you know, the acidity that is coming from either a growing region or a year that is not hot, but you certainly have ripeness uh, due to, thank you, you know, plenty of uh, sunshine and or uh, length on the vine. It is, I would say the finish is, um, 
is medium plus at the moment, you know, and sometimes a nose will express itself more completely when a wine is young and then persist or lengthen as it ages. I think the acidity is medium plus verging on high. It's really mouthwatering. There's almost a salinity to it. The tannins are medium plus. And if I were to qualify them as opposed to quantify them, I would say that they are gently drying. Um, you know, certainly not harsh the way the Nebbiola was. Um, the alcohol is again, medium plus. I feel alcohol in my chest. I, I assess it slightly uh, differently than Tim does, but believe him before me. Uh, but I think it's balanced in the swine and I never look at the numbers. I think that um, the texture is, you know, I don't even know if I can put, I can't put it into lush or lean and round, you know, anything specific. I think it's an example of a ripe, refreshing, medium full red wine that has a moderate plus finish with plenty of uh, promise of complexity to come and terrific quality fruit. Um, so interesting questions, cooler climate or warmer climate wine. I would say probably cooler climate with an extended growing region. No. Uh, growing season, no, no guesses, come on, you know, there's a little bit of a meaty quality to the swine, mm -hmm. but it's, you know, tertiary or further on down the line. Um, and mixed berry fruit, plus some plums in there, dominantly ripe and fresh, not so much dried. This, you know, frankly, I haven't mentioned earth much. There's a little bit of a um, both uh, organic and inorganic earth, but it doesn't drive the wine. It's a secondary element. So, hey, we have, ah, we have growing regions mentioned, Rhone, Walla Walla, maybe Morvedra, Washington, Syrah. So we're in, we're, we're, we're very um, shyly moving into a category. So I think we should go ahead and, ah, I love this. Syrah, but not the Rhone, it's different. So if it were nor the Rhone Syrah before we reveal, what would we hope for? A wall of, I call it Jimmy Dean smell, right? And this is a vegetarian talking, <laughs> you know, smoked meat with white pepper slather <laughs> all over it and black, black pepper. And, you know, um, I think the earthiness of it would would uh, certainly drive the wine, but I like the um, the option. So Carlton's also saying Syrah, period, yay. Let's see what it is and where we are. Go for it, Li Meng. Or Andrea, by the way, the unsung hero of all of our tastings. We are not in Washington. We are in California. We are in Mendocino. We are Mendocino Ridge, which if you look at a map is dead cool. It is the only um, Appalachian that I know of in the United States or anywhere actually, come to think of it, where the Appalachian um, are, is non-contiguous. Mm -hmm. If you look at um, pictures of Mendocino Ridge, it is um, splotchy, right? Um, it is, look how close, there it is, beautiful. Love this uh, picture. Look how close it is to um, the Pacific. You know, this is uh, a winery called Drew that makes Viognier literally six miles from the Pacific, right? This is a little further inland, but we're still talking about tremendous Pacific influence um, and altitude, by the way. You know, we're not at, you know, 2000 uh, feet above sea level, but we're up there. Um, Anderson Valley, fill, uh, further inland, um, Redwood Valley, McDowell Valley, you know, et cetera. But Mendocino Ridge, very interesting growing region, particularly for cool climate Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. Can we reveal the wine, which is what this producer, Drew, um, specializes in, but they also make, as you can see, a killer Syrah, and they make a really gorgeous Viognier um, as well. I love this expression of Syrah. In blind tasting, it would have driven me nuts. I would have had to do it, you know, by process of elimination, which I think you all were quietly and shyly doing in the background. And, you know, I love the fact that you are all willing to put yourselves out there in the chat room. It's terrific. Sometimes people are way too self-conscious. That's got to go out the window, particularly if you're <laughs> going to take a blind tasting exam, you know. Uh, we are all fools if we're not staring at the label, right? This is a husband and wife team, uh, Drew and, um, and Molly, that started this in an abandoned apple orchard, I believe, about uh, 20 years ago. They also grow truffles. They have lots of goats. 
and it is a working farm and they um really specialize in oh look at this uh, i think we're facing in this particular case probably east away from the pacific but you know look at the complexity of um the aspects they um I just forgot exactly what I was going to say, but that's okay, I will forge ahead. Uh, oh, uh, they specialize in using not necessarily their own estates, islands in the sky, exactly right. They use um, uh, many farmers that are producing quality Pinot Noir and Syrah uh, and Chardonnay. And um, uh, I think the Viognier Vineyard is their own. What I love about this wine is it, you know, Syrah to me, is the quiet, well-mannered, unsung hero of all the noble red grapes. It is the great world traveler. You know, it does well pretty much any damn place <laughs> you grow it, from like Alentejo or the coast of Tuscany, or, you know, from the Northern Rhone to Washington State. That was a great guess. And in this case, cool climate, um, Mendocino. And, uh, and it's, it's true to the expression of the terroir of this growing region in the new world. How cool is that? It just doesn't have that expression, a strong expression of meat um, and pepper at this tasting for me. I think the quality level of fruit is very, very high. Gentlemen? Um, I, I, somebody mentioned it earlier. I've got a man crush on Jason Drew. I think he's one of the most extraordinary people it. I've <laughs> met, uh, but also one of the great winemakers. And he and Molly, um, as you can see there mm -hmm. in the picture, are just two of the nicest people there. Um, they are exclusively focused on Mendocino County. They live in the town of Elk, A-E-L-K-E, -E, which is pretty small, but not far away. It's literally in semi-spitting distance of the ocean. And all of the vineyards, people could remember, maybe they could see the small print. There are minimum 1,200 feet above sea level. So it's a non-contiguous vineyard. It is the only one. And um, they're very, very um, choosy, not only about obviously where you can grow grapes legally, but which producers they, they make with. And he has just got a deft touch and whether it's in Pinot Noir, whether it's in his incredible Syrahs, I think you can see here, um, which again shows the cool climate, brilliant, you know, high acid, but brilliant tannin management, beautiful expression of Syrah while truly being new world in personality. But the, the Viognier steals my breath away also. They don't make a lot of it, but it's awfully good stuff and enough, I'll, I'll go on forever. And really good apple cider, I've been told too. They make a dry, uh, you know, more uh, Basque style apple cider, maybe not as funky, but uh, I haven't had it yet, but I've been told it's really good. There you go. I, um, I know we're out of time. So I want to just thank everybody for indulging us for going about five minutes over here. Um, I think we're just getting our sea legs back on for the new year. That said, we do have another webinar coming up on our regular kits. You can buy it as a webinar. Thank you for joining us. We look forward to seeing you next time, uh, hopefully next month.